So we've talked a little bit about stress, and now we're going to delve into what stress causes in a rock sample, that being the strain. So the first thing, strain is, of course, a unitless measure. It's a measure of the change in length per unit length of a sample. You can think of that as delta length per length, right? The units on that, you might say, like I said, it's technically unitless, but you could think of it in a helpful way as meters per meters or foot per foot. Or in the metric system, especially, it's useful sometimes. A meter per meter we might call simply a strain. Meanwhile, if it's, let's say, a millimeter of deformation per meter of original length, we might call that a milli strain. Kind of useful. So what this actually looks like, right? We have a sample that's put in compression, right? just a simple rock core. And let's say that in the y direction, we have way more stress than in the x direction, right? Sigma y is significantly bigger. The arrows here are a lot shorter. Well, your intuition isn't wrong. What's going to happen to that sample over time? I mean, did that a bit long. This is greatly exaggerated, right? But it's going to get shorter and fatter. And that's, of course, the stresses are causing a compression. And because of the compression, because of the volume, right, because the mass is still being inserted, it's going somewhere. And so that consequently might also cause a lengthening of the sample because we have so much less stress in the x direction. So to provide an actual visual on that strain, we might say that this length of the sample originally was L. And then there's some, let's say it deformed evenly on both these sides here by some delta L, delta L on each side, then we might say that the strain in the y direction, epsilon y, is equal to 2 delta L, right? The total deformation divided by the original length L. Since we're using the original length, this is an engineering strain as compared to a regular strain, I suppose, which is if it were to continuously adjust and not use the original length. Right, there are a million steps in between here that could have had different lengths, and we could go from any point in time to the next, but we choose the starting point uh, for simplicity, and most of the time this works perfectly fine. Okay, so that's easy enough. Epsilon x, you could find that as well if I were to assign labels to this. The one thing that's useful to note here, epsilon x is of course the change in the x direction, which we're saying it expands actually, and so that'll be something negative. This is perhaps a little bit counterintuitive, but a decrease in length or negative deformation, if you will, is a positive strain. And that's the case because in rock mechanics, remember, compression is positive stress. So we want to keep our strains and stresses correlated positive with positive. And that just goes back to rocks naturally being in compression in the Earth's crust most of the time, right? Now, there's one more thing to talk about here, just basic theory, and that's shear strain, which is when you apply a shear stress... Right, you can think of it, maybe this is the best way I have to visualize it. You've got your x and y axes, and then you apply, let's say, counterclockwise strain here. And you ask, well, over time, what's going to happen to these, these corners here? Those shear strains are kind of pinching these two corners together, and kind of, since they're pinching these, you might think of them as kind of bulging these two corners out, right? So over time, what we'll have is this becomes a little bit more of a rhombus kind of shape. And the thing to note here, this angle is going to be your delta. That'll be x, y. That's not a delta, that's a gamma, excuse me. And a shrinking angle here, right? If we go from a right angle to a smaller angle, then this will be negative. If we go from a right angle to a larger angle, obtuse like up here, that'll be positive. So a little bit more intuitive on the shear strain conventions. The last thing to note here is that this is only half, actually, of the angular deformation that occurs here, right? So we actually put a half in front here, one half gamma xy. And that's going to be important when we do a Mohr circle, which let's take a look at that right now. Mohr circle is of course an incredibly useful tool for dealing with both stress and strain. We've already looked at it with respect to stresses, so let's take a look at strain now. Normal strain is going to be 
the horizontal axis, easy enough, just like normal stress was the horizontal axis. And then shear strain is going to be the vertical axis. The one thing to note here is that we do still have to divide by two because that angle was only half of the shear strain. It's a little thing you got to be careful about when you carry it over. So I'm not going to draw a full picture this time, but let's say we've got epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy, all of these things. So it's a, it's a complete stress strain. None of these are zero. And we'll say that epsilon x is bigger than epsilon y just for sake of putting some positions out here. So maybe epsilon x is there, epsilon y is there, and then gamma xy, which is negative gamma yx, gamma xy, so the negative one down here, I'll try to keep these uh, pretty similar in length. And remember to divide both of these by two. So to set our circle up, we can go in here, do our little lines again, and then find our points. We want where gamma x touches, uh, excuse me, epsilon x touches gamma xy. These Greek letters, man, they're going to get me dot up there. Epsilon y touches negative gamma xy or gamma yx down here. And you'd say, hey, that looks pretty, pretty neat. We can put a line through there. We do just that. And then we find, remember, our mean, or what I call epsilon m, the middle, I guess you could say, value within there. And with that, we have all the tools we need to fully define this circle. We can come in here and call that 2 theta. We can make from that. Well, first let's let's get our space here. There we go. We'll define epsilon m to be equal to. Remember, it's the average, right? It's the midpoint of these two, so it's just going to be the average of epsilon x plus epsilon y. Those those two over two. And now we can come in and say, okay, we've got a right triangle here. Nine degrees, two theta degrees and some angle there. And what we're really interested in here for finding the principal strains, once again, is this value r. And so we can take a look at this. Okay, this vertical length is gonna be gamma xy over two, right? Just reading it across there. This horizontal value is gonna be the difference between epsilon x and epsilon m. So that's epsilon x minus m. And then this is a right triangle where we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find r here. So r is going to be equal to the square root of delta ga gamma xy over 2 squared plus the difference between epsilon x and epsilon m squared. And then you can go ahead and plug in your value for epsilon m again if you want this strictly in terms of your x, y, and your gamma x, y. And then what you'll find then is you'll go some distance r out here, and you'll find epsilon 1, you'll go some distance r backwards, and you'll find epsilon 2. So these are your principal strains, your maximum and minimum that will occur. And these also occur, you'll notice, where the shear strain is equal to 0. So to actually define that, we would say, I won't write the whole thing out. You can see the full equation for the stress. It's going to be incredibly similar to that from my other video. We'll say that's epsilon x plus r, and epsilon 2 is epsilon m, excuse me, minus r. So those are going to be your principal strains the axes along the angle at which the maximum deformation will occur compared to your original state. You can use that to find theta. And with that, if we have these points, then we have a fully defined Mohr circle. We can come in and once again, I'll just attempt to kind of tidy this up here. Maybe come around like that. Okay, okay, this one's not looking too bad. Maybe getting better with these circles. And now with a confident stroke, we'll come around just hit the whole thing. Beautiful. And that is a fully defined strain Moore's circle. And it's important, of course, to know about strain because sometimes 
strain can impose energy, right? You think about a big rock mass together, and let's say, especially if you've got like a pillar and you're compressing it, or even worse, if there's some source of tension in it and it's trying to expand outwards, right? That expansion, you're going to be preventing its motion if you have some solid roof up and down here. That's going to turn into energy. And you put too much energy on a surface you, see, surface, you can have things like rock bursts in the underground, which is, of course, incredibly dangerous. So these high-stress environments, oftentimes it's a really good idea to be physically looking at strain. And in fact, that's something that can be most evident with like underground excavations, you know, circular tunnels, just looking at how they might be closing in on themselves or things like that. Things that can be readily uh, viewed by anyone, miners, geologists, doesn't matter. But yeah, that is engineering strain as applied to rock mechanics.